They just got huh. They're on air. Okay. Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the um, October Beecraft um, Hangout. Uh, Rodri is your usual host, but I'm afraid he couldn't make it this evening, so I'm here. I'm Richard, one of the deputy editors at Beecraft, and I'm joined by three other guests, and I'm going to let them um, introduce themselves. We'll start on uh, with with Kevin, who's on, on the left-hand side of my screen, but I think he'll pop up as soon as he starts talking. Good evening, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Kevin Bourne, and I live in the Chironde department in southwest France where we keep anywhere between 10 and 20 hive, depending on the activity that's going on. We keep our bees predominantly for education purposes. People come stay with us and they learn about bees and beekeeping from here in France and from in the UK. Terrific, thank you. Uh, and then we'll move on to Sarah Redled, who's joining us from the United States uh, this evening, which she'll tell you, um, or tell us exactly where she is. Hi. Yeah, hello. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sarah, and I run a nonprofit organization based in Oregon in the US. And I run about in between 30 and 40 hives at most um, times, and they're all used for research and education. And our two main focuses at my organization, the Bee Girl organization, are youth education and also um, bee habitat conservation and restoration work. Thank you. And then uh, we have a very familiar face, another Beecraft <laughs> member, uh, which is Wendy. Hello, Wendy. Hi there, Richard, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'm the marketing manager for Beecraft, and uh, I'm very pleased to say I've recovered from the National Honey Show. I've had <laughs> bees for the past eight years and um, at one point we were way up in the, um, the high teens um, well not the high teens 50 60 hives um, and uh, have recently this year really reduced down to just five um, for various reasons and um, that five is going to be ni a nice number to cope with so um, that's my history and I've been with Beecraft now I think probably about the same length of time. Uh, where are you, Wendy? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm in North Devon, um, oh. so I was very close to the um, incursion of the Asian hornet last year. Okay. Too close for comfort. That leaves me. Uh, so I'm Richard, um, one of the deputy editors of Beecraft. Um, I'm talking of Asian hornet incursions. I live in rural Wiltshire, but only about. Uh, seven miles from the very first Asian Hornet incursion we had here in Tetbury, which was two years ago. So that was uh, a bit of a worrying time. Um, I keep between 20 and 30 colonies. It's winter now, it's just going into winter, so I've got it down to about 20, which I think is a sensible number. Um, uh, and I just keep them as a hobby and uh, to produce a little bit of, little bit of honey. Um, so uh, today's uh, subject, which Rodri um, originally set, was a season roundup. Um, so it's, it's pretty much the end of the beekeeping season, although it's been unseasonably warm up until the last couple of days here at last, uh, at least. Um, but I'm interested to know what your, your season has been like for each of you. Um, maybe starting with Kevin, you could tell us a bit about what your year has been like with the bees, um, how it's gone, what problems you've had, and what, what state they're in now. Mm, uh, a challenging to describe it in one word. Uh, we have had a, a conflagration of circumstances in France into 2018, which basically started with weather patterns, abnormal weather patterns in 2017, which basically, without boring you, meant that the bees couldn't forage enough at the times they should have been foraging. And that the knock-on effect of that was weaker colonies going into the winter, increased use of stores of neonicotinoids and other pesticides which are still allowable here in France even though you can't buy any more uh, there's a dispensation for agriculture and industry to use up the stores they already have purchased so and that can take anything up to two years to run through so that cocktail of not enough of the right things to eat at the right times of the year the pesticides and insecticides, miticides that were continually being used. And the Asian hornet was the straw that broke the camel's back, which led us to spring 2018, 
with a loss of around six, anecdotally, around 60 to 65 percent of the kept bee colonies in France. Um, it's got it's got to a point here this year where if you are a registered professional beekeeper, the government has set aside funds to help you get that industry back back on its feet. There wasn't a bee to be bought across France in the summer here, so we were we were importing them from from Eastern Europe. Lots of carniolan bees coming into France. Uh, it's considerably more than you would ordinarily see because there, were, there, there weren't any breeders that had stock because they suffered from exactly the same, the same uh, symptoms, causal, I should say, uh, effects as everybody else. So that's how we started the year. Then the summer was, for, for the heat and the temperature that you had in the UK that was unseasonably high, add 7 to 10 degrees C to that. And that's what, that's what it was like here in our part of France. And it was regular... regular 40, 45 degrees C in the south of them. And that gave the bees a similar issue, just um, prevented crops from growing, prevented flowers from growing, um, damaged pollination, impacted on forage negatively. So this year, we are forewarned and forearmed, though. We, we, whilst we've had a, a significant Asian hornet problem in Chiron, the part of France I live in, um, it's, it's just a, a business as usual to have an Asian hornet problem in certain areas of France. So we now know that we need to do things a little bit differently for the winter coming up, but we'll, we'll get on to that, I'm sure. So in summary, our year has been challenging. Hot, predators, too many chemicals, not enough for the bees to eat when they needed it. Josh, who'd be a beekeeper? I know. And despite that, the girls still produced enough honey for us to have a little bit of a surplus. So we're very proud of them this year. Right. Okay, uh, that's Kevin. What about you in um, in Oregon, Sarah? Oh gosh, um, this was a it was a, a crazy year for us as well. I had a really rough winter last year. I lost I the biggest losses I've ever had. Um, and a lot of folks had losses and have a lot of ideas and theories about why. And I know exactly why. I was so busy at the end of last year. I did not get on top of my varroa mite control. And I just let it go for way too long. We really should start keeping an eye on varroa and um, taking steps to um, treat in July and August. And I really didn't get on top of it until November. And it was just to or October, November. It was just too late. And I lost about 90% of my colonies, which I felt really bad about. And it was really, I felt all on me. Um, that lived came out of the gorgeous. And I was able to do quite a bit of, um, I did a, a couple splits and um, I was able to buy um, some nukes from Randy Oliver's sons, which Randy Oliver's a researcher here on the West Coast, um, which was really fun to get some, just uh, some genetics that were bred for my climate, but from a totally different place. Um, and then I uh, also restarted with um, some, uh, some other queens and made a bunch of nukes, um, which did not go well. And so the first part of my um, the, the queens that I started with were from Hawaii, and I got a terrible batch, and it was just a really, really, really hard start to the year. Um, and uh, and then on, on, so that was on the beekeeper side of it, just mistakes that I made from uh, not treating for bro last year in 2017 when I should have, and then also just um, uh, restarting with queens that uh, I shouldn't have. I should have just waited and gotten queens that were more adapted um, from my from my neck of the woods and also more um, from a more reliable source. Um, and then from outside of the hive, environmental issues, I could say our biggest one was wildfires, um, which was really interesting. So I don't know if you saw the news or not, but um, the whole west coast of the U.S. was on fire from mid-July until a about less than a month ago. 
And it was really interesting because everybody's question was, oh, when, how is the fires affecting the bees? How is the fires affecting the bees? And it was, um, it, it is hard to really tell. And um, it is really hard to set up a study where you could actually say, this is how wildfires affect the bees, because how do you control for <laughs> thousands of acres of, um, you know, I mean, if you're setting up a study, you would have to feed them the same thing, make sure the Varroa treatment was the same, the Varroa thresholds were about the same, and then either, and, and all of the, um, the foraging and the nutrition were the same, and then either have thousands and thousands of acres of forest on fire or not. <laughs> so, so it's a really hard thing to actually say. But anecdotally, I can say I was quite shocked that my bees, once I took care of all of my problems, had a fan fantastic summer. They did really well. They seem to be a lot less heat stressed. Um, in the last few years, our, our temperatures have been upwards of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 40 degrees centigrade Celsius for a lot of the summer. But with the thick, thick blanket of smoke on top of our valley, it was more down around um, 80 and 90 degrees, which is about 30, between probably 30 and 36 degrees Celsius. Um, so it was, a, the bees seem to be a lot less heat stressed than they usually are. And also the plants seem to be less heat stressed as well. And so where oftentimes in the last few years, I've been seeing plants like um, blackberries that we really rely on for for bee forage, they just dry up, dried up before the, they barely even bloom and then they just dry up into nothingness because it's so hot. But um, the plants seem to be a lot less stressed out and which was really, really interesting. And there seems to be, um, again, this is anecdotal. I don't have the research to really show it, um, but there seemed to be more nectar and pollen and the bees seem to do quite well. So I actually ended the year um, oh, and I got way more on top of my varroa control this year. And so I actually ended the year in a really positive note, despite the wildfires, um, which is, which is kind of crazy. And we also luckily don't have Asian hornets here that we have to deal with. Um, and, uh, and I, I live in a valley where I'm really lucky to have, um, a very rare pesticide kill, um, which isn't, um, typical for all of the U.S. There's, we still are, you know, uh, working with farmers on ways that we can um, best make sure that the bees are protected. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, that. That was my year. It was pretty. It was a roller coaster ride for sure, and very interesting and confusing. And part of me wanted the <laughs> the bees to have a really hard time with all the smoke, so I could be like. See, climate change is the worst for everything. But um, unfortunately, I have to say, it seems like it could have actually been a good thing this year. So every year is different, and that was that was my year. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. That was fascinating. Yeah, uh, there that I, I took away. One is the importance of trying to get your varroa treatment done early enough, which isn't isn't always um, easy, depending on what your weather patterns are and what your forage is like, and also the um, importance of trying to find good locally sourced queens, queens that uh, are um, good for your own particular area. Um, we had yeah. quite a lot of fires in this country, not not where I am, but certainly in the uh, further north, you, well, you probably wouldn't have heard about it, but a lot of the, the moors where our beekeepers take their um, bees for the heather had very serious fires. Oh, okay. This year. Some bees were lost, um, although most, Interesting. Of the, most of the fires were before the beekeepers moved the um, the hives up onto the heather, so luckily the bees weren't affected, but there wasn't really um, any heather there for them to, to forage on. Uh, how was it for you, um, Wendy? I'm suspecting your season was probably very similar to mine, because you're not actually very many miles from me as the bee flies. Uh, no, we're not that far. Um, well, because we were reduce, wanting to reduce our number of hives this year, uh, we lost a few over the winter. Uh, and uh, sold some right in the spring so that was it was good to get the responsibility of them to the person that they were going to actually and um, it's i feel time has not been on our side or wasn't on our side in the spring so it was a, a relief really when we 
sold those off. Um, we have lost a couple of colonies through the summer. Um, I don't really know why. Um, but apart from that, we've had, uh, obviously the weather's been hot, but it's been, you know, I've been quite surprised that there has still been, we've still had a reasonable crop of honey. Uh, I tried to avoid the oilseed rate, but unfortunately didn't manage to do that this year because I, suddenly all these fields start springing up. You move your colonies to somewhere where there isn't any oilseed rape, and then all of a sudden you find the yellow fields you're surrounded by. So that's always a problem for me um, with oilseed rape. But beyond that, um, the bees are those that have come through and, and done well, have done really well. Um, with really full brood boxes going into winter, some brood and a half. And so I'm quite quite happy with that, actually. I think it's um, they've been, um, been quite pleased, um, particularly as a lot of people on the East Coast have not actually had any honey whatsoever, um, completely dry for their bees. So I don't know what the difference is because you actually would expect that the, the bees would... Uh, or the, the forage, the, the plants would go over more quickly. But actually, it, that didn't seem to happen here. Uh, and we didn't have rain, like everywhere else. We didn't have the rain, but it's almost as if the plants had adapted and just kept going. Um, it was it was really quite a strange year from, from the plant point of view. Um, so we've got five strong colonies going into the winter, and I'm pleased that we've just got that number now. Uh, I just feel that we can give them more attention, uh, better attention, the, you know, the, the attention they deserve and they need. And we can take a bit of time to, to sit down and actually watch what goes on in the apiary. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that was, that was interesting, Wendy. Uh, funnily enough, have, despite having said that um, we're close to each other, it sounds like we have a fairly good season, uh, actually. Um, last winter here was uh, mild and wet, and I would have liked it to be colder because the bees got through a lot of stores. Um, and I do, unlike you, I, I like oilseed rape. Um, it brings in a lot of honey, and it's very useful for um, building up colonies, um, getting wax drawn, and so forth. Um, but we had here uh, in the UK what they call the beast from the east. Um, so. When was that, Wendy? Do you remember roughly? That was in about March, wasn't it? Yes. So um, we had we had a cold snap at the end of the winter, and then we had a period where we thought we were going into spring, and the bees began to build up very well. Um, and I was getting very glad about that because I thought the all seed rape was coming on. Um, and then we had another two or three weeks of very cold weather, and a lot of people lost bees in, in that period. Um, lucky I didn't, didn't lose any colonies this year. Um, but I did have to feed um, immediately after that cold snap, um, avoid losing it. Um, and then uh, everything seemed to fall into place. We had quite a long spring where we had a combination of warm weather and, and rain, so the oilseed rape flowered and produced a lot of nectar. Um, summer came along very quickly afterwards, um, and here we have a lot of lime trees and the lime honey lovely if we get it we didn't get any last year because we had a late frost which knocked all the flowers off but this year we did very well a lot of light um uh and then we had went into the brambles but we had intense heat uh this summer with very little rain um and the, the flow dried up very quickly so by about mid-july there was nothing nothing happening here uh but that was quite good because i was able to take off the honey and get all the varroa treatments done so i'm quite happy with the way the bees um shape they're in um, in terms of varroa very low varroa drops this year so i didn't have to treat um in all my apiaries um where are we then and then, then we've had a very long autumn really only the last few days we've had frost only yesterday i was out and there was still a flowering ivy so the bees have taken in a lot of ivy nectar and they've got lots of stores i don't worry about ivy too much i don't have problems with it um and so it's been a good year i've i've i've, <laughs> I've spent a fortune on honey buckets <laughs> Oh, I wish I'd known. I could have brought you a lot. That... Oh, <laughs> nothing to complain about. So, yeah, um, I, I, it's been an interesting year, weird in terms of um, patterns. 
I mean, you said that you thought that the um, where you were, the bramble and flowers bloomed for a long time, but here they were over very quickly. But that's probably a difference in you know, the, the soil structure. Mm. Um, you know, perhaps your soil holds more more water than ours. Um, anyway, we've got a few um, a few questions that have come in, um, and we've just been talking a little bit about winter. Well, the first question is from someone called Gary, and he he wanted to know. Um, if he should be adding some form of insulation to his hives. He says he's got national hives and um, his bees are all fed and treated and ready for winter. Um, it's only his second winter, but he's after, I think probably after the cold winter last year, he's worried about whether or not he should add any insulation of any sort to his hives. Anybody have any thoughts on that? What do, they, what do you guys do? We, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off if I may. We have learned over the over the few years we've been here in France that there is no hard and fast rule other than pay close attention to the weather forecast. Um, in 2018, we, we used to have a, a textbook approach to insulation in that we would have assess the longer term weather forecast, maybe insulate with some, uh, some thermic material underneath the, the metal roofs. We keep our bees in the Dant hives, which are French and are like a national hive, but about 15 to 20 percent bigger. So about 75, 80,000 bees at, at the peak season. And we keep them in Warre hives, again, which are French tall columnar hives, which are designed very much for bee health, whereas the Dedant frame, uh, the Dedant hives are designed very much for beekeepers to make it easy for us to generate tons and tons of honey and other hive products and get access to it easily. And we used to um, use various proprietary insulation materials as a matter of course, because that's what we did in the UK. And um, <clears throat> we came here and the, the winter, the, the, sea, the winter is harsh here, not for a very short period of time. So minus 15, minus 16 degrees C is typical um, for, for, uh, for us. Uh, in January and into February, but then we get a faux spring, a false spring, and it happened again in 2018, and we, <clears throat> the sun came out, so third week of February, which is when my birthday is, I was outside in the garden um, with insect repellent and a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, it was 23, 24 degrees again, <laughs> so we thought, great, all the bees were out flying, left the winter clusters, and then over the course of a weekend, the temperatures hit minus uh, degrees again with a vengeance and stayed that way for about five days. And we had flurries of snow, nothing too significant, certainly not by Oregon standards, uh, nothing too significant. And when the sun came out again, so it went back to 20 degrees after that week, what had happened in two of our hives at least is that the bees had been fooled into thinking spring had arrived. And they had broken their cluster, started foraging, bringing it back into the various parts of the brood box where they were going to store it and promptly froze to death in groups of 10 to 15. So when we actually opened the hive, we lifted up comb after comb, frame after frame after frame of very upsetting visions, very upsetting vistas of handfuls of bees had literally frozen solid overnight because the temperature had dropped that quickly. And they hadn't had instinct to, to tell them to reform into the winter cluster because as far as they were concerned, it was spring. So what we have learned this year is to pay more attention to the weather forecast. And, and if we have to get outside with jackets and blankets to wrap around the hive to deal with this cold spring and back into a cold snap again, then so be it. That's what we will do because we don't want to experience the same levels of losses. Mm. The second thing about insulation is that if you, if you get very cold winters, is damp through condensation. And nationals in the UK and the Dedans we have here, um, and the Langstros, unless they have chalet roofs specifically, will typically have flat roofs. So as our 34 to 37 degree C bees are heating up the inside of their hive, we're insulating that from above typically, and the condensation on a chalet roof would run down and then down the sides of the hive as it's designed to. On a commercially produced flat roof hive, it's just like a sweating nightclub 
after a rock gig, you know, the ceiling is sweating and dripping on all the dancers. And we opened up some of our hives to note, it, to, to note this spring an awful lot of mold on the crown boards. And we don't want that getting anywhere near the hives this year, getting anywhere near the brood. So what we will be doing, we'll be insulating using the Warre method for all of our larger Dadan hives this year, which means making a quilt box. For anyone that doesn't, doesn't know that or isn't familiar with Warre hives, it means using an eek or a small super and putting a sackcloth hessian base so air can pass through it, filling that quilt box with straw or wood shavings. We use straw because it's easy to, to clean out and absorbs the moisture and doesn't get too heavy. And then putting a ventilated roof on the top of that. The point being that it both insulates and allows for ventilation, so it stops um, it stops the moisture buildup inside the hives. So we're going to be experimenting with that along with some of our beekeeping uh, friends here this winter. Okay. Uh, I like very, very uh, interesting, quite complex approach. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's just, it's just we, we, we concluded we've got to try something different because all of the textbooks we have weren't written with the weather we've experienced for the last two or three years in mind. So we have to adapt. Well, I, th I think that's what beekeeping is all about, though, isn't it? It's all about um, reading the bees, the environment, the situation, and as you say, adapting and um, adapting to it. Well, what are your winters like, um, Sarah? And what do you um, <laughs> with that? Um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm having kind of some technical difficulties. We can hear you. My Wi Fi is really funny. I can hear you. Can, can okay. Me? Yeah. I think we actually, uh, our weathers are pretty similar it sounds like to um, France we actually have a bit of a I'm in southern Oregon so I'm only about seven miles north of California so we have a pretty Mediterranean climate um, but it's the same thing it's it, every year is different and it's a guessing game every single winter because some winters it's freezing cold with temperatures well below zero and other winters it's very warm and we don't get any snow at all but um for the most part our winters are quite rainy and so i actually i learned how to keep bees when i was a student at the university of montana in missoula and and um and it was very very cold it was below zero for most of the winter the bees never flew and so we always winterized and insulated the hives we pushed all of the hives together in their stands and we wrapped them in roofing paper and stapled them all together and um and that's how we insulated and then when i moved to oregon what i had heard from folks was actually don't insulate your hives because it's wet here and it's so much more important for you to have um, to have dry bees than warm bees because we do have the same thing. We have every, every once in a while we'll get we call it January. We get a um, we get 70 degree Fahrenheit days, 80 degree Fahrenheit days, which are about 30 degrees centigrade here, and and it happens in February too, and then it'll go right back down to below zero. So it's um, it's really it's complicated for bees and i really do believe that most bees didn't evolve with these kinds of weird roller coaster um up and down weather changes and so it is hard for them and i think it is up to us as beekeepers to figure out what we can do to make sure that the bees are as comfortable as they possibly can be and so um i never insulated my hives when i first moved to oregon um but uh, the research is actually starting to show that hives are insulated as long as you can also keep them dry will um, will actually uh, they're healthier and they're happier and they come out of the winter a lot stronger if they are insulated and also fed. So um, Dewey Karen, uh, um, Professor Emeritus from um, the East Coast who now lives in Oregon did a survey last year. And in Oregon, for Oregon beekeepers, the one linchpin of 
bees that survived versus bees didn't, the most common thing was overwinter feeding, whether that's fondant, um, fondant or winter candy or doing some sort of um, non-liquid uh, winter feeding. So that does seem to be important. So um, this year I'm gonna think hard on how I can insulate my hives with making sure they still have breathability so they don't get um, super wet. Because the way that I think of it is like a pair of mittens. And if you go outside wearing mittens and it's dry um, and it's 20 below zero, your hands are going to be warm. But if you go outside wearing fuzzy mittens and it's pouring down rain and your fuzzy mittens get warm and it's 20 below zero, your hands are going to freeze and fall off. And so um, I think of my bees the same way in the wintertime as, oh, how can I keep them warm, but also make sure that the um, carbon monoxide dioxide and the, uh, all of the, the moisture that they generate in the hive um, can also make it out of the hive. So yeah, it's a tricky thing of trying to figure out um, how to keep them dry and warm at the same time. Um, people do do quilt boards here. Most people keep length draft hives. Some people have two hours, some people have one. I uh, I do wood chips feeder to hive in the inner cover and those soaks up a lot of moisture as well. So um, those are those are my tricks so far. I haven't insulated, but I'm gonna look into it this year for sure. Um, and then I also am really on top of my wood chips and also my winter feeding, and that seems to work. If if I might just add some research here. Um, last month at our bee association meeting that said that over winter uh, a healthy colony can produce more than 20 liters of water through respiration mm -hmm. that, that has to go somewhere that has to go somewhere and some and if there's no way to evaporate that's just going to hang around inside and Sarah is absolutely right, and it's in its way we're trying to, to, to insulate using slightly different, me different methodology and transferring it to commercial hives. It's to keep them damp free, just like the chickens, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that damp really is the worst, worst thing for bees um, in the winter. Um, I have a very simple regime. I do the same every winter. It's not very imaginative. Um, I keep my bees on nationals with open mesh floors. Um, when we finish the season, I just pop a slab of Celotex or Kingspan, the insulation material. I, um, I, I keep my eye out when I'm passing building sites and if there's any little bits poking up out of skips, if there's a bit that's beehive sized, I stop and get out and it goes in the back of the car. Uh, and I cut it so that it fits inside a super which goes above the crown board. I make sure it's not too tight. Um, so there's a little bit of breathability, air can get around it and then my roofs are, have usual ventilation in the top so there's a bit of ventilation and, and that's that's it the, that stays on there right until i'm sure that spring is with us to stay yeah. um, i usually stick a little bit of um a, an old coat hanger or wire in it so i've got a handle it's easy to lift up and down if i need to stick some fondant in then i'll lift it up and that will go underneath uh, the insulation it's incredible if you do pick up the insulation to feel that the heat on the underside on that that bit of tin foil it really gives you a sense of how much um heat has been generated um, in the hive, but there's there's plenty of ventilation. I have the open mesh um, floors. They're open all winter. I leave them open all winter unless it's really cold. Uh, and I'm not entirely. There's nothing scientific about this. I just feel sorry for them. And so if it's getting really cold, I go up and throw a tray and and just give them a you know a little bit of um, bit less of a draft um, around the bottom. But that, that's it. Um, um, and it seems it seems to work. Um, my bees. What about you, Wendy? What, what what's your approach? Well, I've got polyhives, Langstroth polyhives, and I have never ever had a problem with condensation inside them. And I know I don't have the same sort of weather as you've got in France and, and Oregon, um, but uh, I always operate on an open mesh floor unless the colony is a little bit on the small side, uh, and I'm a bit concerned about it. As Richard says, you know, feeling a little bit sorry for them or putting in a Varroa tray when when you're looking for them to, to start at the beginning of the, of the spring and um, looking for them to, to build up just to give them a, a little more warmth then. So no condensation. Um, I do, if I need to feed with fondant, then I will use an eek and um, same as Richard, actually, uh, I will have 
um, I have like plastic tubs, about pound tubs, that um, I make a hole in the, um, we use Rectocell, but the same sort of thing as Kingspan, um, have a hole in there um, to take the, um, take the fondant, to take the tub with the fondant, but I'll use an inner, inner hive cover, just a sheet of Perspex. Is it Perspex? I don't know, um, but it's clear, and so I'll just have a hole in the, in that, so that they can actually get up to the fondant, uh, and use the rector cell to not to fill the yeast, just to put a layer there. Um, the roofs are flat. Uh, there is no ventilation at the top, um, but it seems to work just fine. Um, I even put an old car rug into um, one of the one of the eats when I didn't have any Kingspan to put to hand to put in, and and I just put that in. But you know, that seems to work just fine. I don't. Um, the only co the colonies that I have lost over winter and touch wood has been where they've had plenty of food, but actually uh, it's been in another part of the the hive and they've not actually got to it. Um, but um so i mean that they're they're insulated i i just feel that the uh the poly hives are excellent for that and something that works really really well actually is um nukes um because if you've got a lot of bees you can just do a double nuke and actually that works really well they come through the come through the winter absolutely brilliantly in that okay so that's, yeah is, I'm interested, in, in the UK, are there any discussions or, or papers being circulated about the use of, because you guys have talked about using um, building materials, basically, for, for insulating beehives, and, and we used to do something quite similar with polystyrene um, boards and, and slabs and, and old bits of, of, of plasterboard, effectively. But here, there, there, there's a lot of talk right now it's it's, it's hypothesizing stages but about the vocs and the gaseous release and the breakdown of those materials over time not being any better for the bees inside a hive than it would be in our homes where it's used so there is a there is a bit of a move away from using king's band and, and, and home insulation material for hive. Well, then, yeah but it's not um it's not actually inside the hive because you've got a uh, the um You've got your, your an inner hive cover which is just clear, um, and then you've got a hole which will the bees can so they can get up, but directly into the pot with the fondant in. Yeah. And you cut a you cut a hole in the um, rectus cell, whatever whatever you want to call it, um, just to take that pot. So it's not actually within the hive. Um, and the bees are actually accessible to it. Yeah, except for the hole they're crawling through. Uh, no, no, they're not. They're not in touch. You've got a small hole that they can come up into the tub. Um, a small hole like that is all we do, and the tub completely covers that, and the rector cell is outside that. Okay. So they don't come into contact with it at all. Yeah, I, I I have a similar situation, and um, I use exactly the same thing. I use those plastic tubs that they, they sell Chinese food in. And the fondant goes in there, so there, there's um, the bees aren't in contact with the um, with the material. I have had them get out and get in contact, and they nibbled it a lot, uh, yes. and I wasn't happy about that. I would I would, I would you know try to avoid that situation again because it, I don't know what it's made of but i'm sure it isn't very nice i think it's quite <laughs> I, like, I, I do like the idea of the um the sawdust um quilts i have thought about that before i've just been a little bit too lazy to uh take it any further but i think it's a good idea um talking about the um the fondant there was a question here somebody was just asking about when they should think about yeah. having handy in, in the winter um <laughs> what do you guys do do you wait until you think they might need it or do you give them some just in case or do you wait to a certain time in england there was always a, a tradition of um giving them some candy at christmas <laughs> nobody nobody suggest i'll tell you what i'll do okay and then you can think about it <laughs> um so i i i wait usually well i i have the hives just to keep an eye on on how heavy they are 
so I have a sense of what um, what's going on on the inside. But usually around about mid January, I will pop a bit of fondant on each on each colony, whether I think they need it or not. And it's just a small tub, like uh, Wendy said. I should imagine there's probably only a couple of hundred grams in there. And then every week or so, I just quickly lift up the insulation material and see if the bees have made their way up in there and are they consuming it. And if they are consuming it and, and at a rate, then I might put a, a larger amount on maybe um, one of the bags it comes in. Um, so that's my that's my approach to when I when I will add fondant. Um, what about you guys? I try as hard as I can to always just let the bees be bees more than anything. I just I. I want them to eat their own honey and I don't want a supplementary feed as much as I possibly can. But um, like we've been talking about with the weather, um, just really doing strange things and also habitat loss and they're not seeing a lot of enough flowers because of changes in the weather, um, farming changes, habitat um, or, or land use uh, practices. It, I, I do think that the bees do need our help um, oftentimes. And so it's, if I can at all, um, I just, especially if I have a colony that's really strong and has a ton of honey, I, it's hard for me to give them sugar. <laughs> but I also think if they want it, they'll eat it. And if they don't want it, then they won't eat it. And so I do, I'll make um, uh, winter caves and it turns out different every time. And I try and be as natural as I possibly can. And I use sugar and then a little bit of, um, uh, vinegar and some essential oils and then I make uh, a tea for them out of um, herbs um, using the spikenard uh, bee sanctuary biodynamic tea recipe and I try and get it as close to that as I possibly can and then that will be my base and I use the hot water um, and then I mix the sugar into it and that's how I make my winter tea so I try and make it as healthy and as full as plant um, uh, polyphenols as I possibly can for the bees and then um, I just take big old chunks and I put it on top of the inner cover on wax paper and some of the bees just plow through it in uh, a week or so and some take the whole entire winter to eat it and so I just write about this time actually about uh, mid-November um, make quite a few chunks of, um, of winter candy and just Put it on all of my hives and if they want it they want it and if they don't they don't and if they eat it all then i'll make them more kevin I, we're, the, we're the same start start with, start with your observations in the autumn before you're closing up about general health size of the colony and before feeding we'll one of the one of the key drivers for feeding for us is knowing how many bees there are i mean exactly in your colony before you close them up but but give or take are they a healthy brood colony so one of the first things we've discovered and learned from, from talking with other people is that if you need to reduce unused space i frames that don't have food on them because there are fewer bees then actually it's reduced the need to feed them they're not having to generate as much body heat to keep a larger space warm during the winter so actually we've saved the need of feeding by reducing the space inside hives with dummy boards uh, and, and, and and such but then we, we're the same as you Richard we, we heft and it's um to get a dedant hive through the winter is between 19 and 20 kilos of store so if they're there or thereabouts we'll we'll just leave them be literally but we will pop out on boxing day uh, with a with a slab of candy and we will put it on as a maybe part of it is just a, the, a hangover from tradition from the UK but as Sarah said the 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 bees they're not like dogs they don't gorge if they don't want it um, and it doesn't do any harm being there particularly because we're going to have quilt boxes on this winter into which I've made a, a, a strip across the middle of wood with a feeding hole in it so I can actually put the candy in a plastic container over the feeding hole in the quilt box. And if they want, if they want it, they'll take it. And if not, they won't. So it, it's not, we, we don't believe we can do any damage by feeding solid food in the winter uh, because the bees won't bulge unless they actually want it. We'd rather not have to. But. 
being proactive, I think, is key. Well, it sounds like it sounds like there's some sort of unity of approach. I think there. A lot of us don't like the idea of feeding our bees uh, sugar if we don't have to, but we're all concerned about their welfare and you know give them the opportunity um, to have some feed if they um, if they want it. I think I think we'll move on because we, we're running out of time. And we've got a couple of other little questions. Um, one of them somebody asked, which I think is quite nice, is what books would you recommend over winter? I think one of the nicest things about keeping bees is that there, there is a period when um, actually there's not a lot of beekeeping uh, to do and it's a good excuse to um, open a book and do a bit of reading. What do you guys recommend? What's on your bookshelves? Mine's Beecraft magazines, of course. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's an opportunity to catch up on the, the articles that I may not have read during the course of the year. How about that? Very good. We have, um, my wife and I, Amanda and I both keep the bees here. So Amanda has a favourite, which is the Collins Beekeeper's Bible, which has everything that a beginner through to an intermediate level beekeeper probably needs, including a whole raft of recipes and things you can do with the other hive products as well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bloke of a certain age. So I'm used to not having very much money and having to fix and repair my own old cars and motorcycles. So the very famous company, Haynes, that made the workshop manuals for cars and motorbikes also make one for beekeepers. And it suits me down to the ground because there's a description of the 10 things you have to do right next to pictures of every stage. And it just, it, it works very simply for me. But again, it's, it's, it's um, beginner to intermediate level. And the other one we would recommend is um, Abbe Warre's um, Beekeeping for All, which is a French book originally, written at the turn of the last century. Well, finished it kind of 1920, something like that. And um, it's still on the bestsellers here in France. And it is, it's his musings and thoughts and process on how to run with the people's hive, as he called it, or the warre hive, as we know it, which is a, not just a different set of boxes, but a different set of approaches and methodology, which is all about caring for the bees rather than being a harvesting beekeeper. So those are our three. And I think um, if you uh, if you don't read French, there's an English translation, I think, by David Heath. Quite right. My apologies. Yes, there is. I'll be, we have both, and I've given up. <laughs> yeah. Now, David Heath translation is very good and he's also written um at least one possibly two books himself about his own experiences with the warrior hive and they're really worth um reading i think uh what about you um sarah oh i would say that my uh top three books for the winter to recommend would be um uh honey bee democracy by tom seeley tom seeley is an animal animal behavior uh researcher at cornell and has done just some really fascinating and interesting research on um, on honeybee as a democracy, the honeybee hive as a democracy. And I read it when I first got into beekeeping um, in the mid 2000s. I, I am going to pick it up and reread it again this winter, and I'm excited to do that. Um, I also read uh, Susan Brackney's book Plan B, which is really interesting and entertaining and a super fast read and has a lot in it for um, just very interesting uh, stories about um, honey culture. There's a, a really cool chapter in there about different cultures through the ages and how they've used honey. And um, you'll have to read it and, and, uh, and tell me what you think about what the ancient Chinese would do with their wise men and their emperors and honey. And it has to do with embalming and eating body parts so <laughs> there's a little teaser um and then also that's the halloween um, as well. yeah that's the halloween that's my halloween assignment oh. and, then, um, and i also am reading a book right now called pharmacology which is really good and it um doesn't actually have much to do with bees but it has to do i um my latest bee health and the different uh, ways that soil health and bee health holistically go together and why we need to be caring about both things. And uh, so it's a book on um, holistic farming and farming and 
soil and how it all really just comes back to soil. And one of the farmers in the block actually do have bees as well. So there are, is a mention of bees in there, but it's really entertaining. It's a fast read. It was written by a medical doctor actually in her um, quest to find if there, what kind of, um, how the medical world and how the farming world could overlap and maybe be useful to each other. And so it's, a, it's called pharmacology and it's really fascinating and a entertaining and quick read. So those are my three. Okay, thank you very much. Well, a couple of you is one of my ideas. I'm glad, Kevin, that you uh, mentioned the Haynes Manual. That's written by Claire Waring and Adrian Waring, Claire being um, uh, the editor at Beecroft. And I, it is really a in his book. Um, well, not just beginners, in fact. Um, as you said, it's got lots of um, very good how-to diagrams. And if you're in a bit of a fix and you're panicking, you're not sure quite the, what the best thing to do is, it's um, a great reference book. I've just grabbed some from my um, shelf that I'd like to recommend. Um, one is this, it's called Healthy Bees Are Happy Bees. I'm not sure if that's in focus. No, it's um, not. Uh, by Pam Gregory. This is a second edition. And, and I, th I think this is the best book, particularly if you're doing the BBK modules um, on honeybee health. Um, it's quite concise, but it's really well written. Um, and I think it has everything that you need to help you identify um, diseases and pests and problems around the hive. I'd really recommend um, that book. Um, I, I think probably a book on bee diseases sounds not like um, fun reading, but um, it's a quite a good read. Um, and then other good read, well, this isn't much of a good read, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a quick read. It's called At the Hive Entrance um, by um, H. Storch. And um, it's a, uh, a list of observations that you might make looking at your bees from the outside of the hive um, so it simply says if your bees are doing this or if you spot that maybe this is what's happening um, on the inside so it, it's really a fascinating little book i like that um, i read this a couple of years ago and um, it's a tom seeley book um, called following the wild bees and it's um, it's about uh, something called bee lining uh, which isn't something we really know about or do in the UK, um, but I think it's more of a thing in the States. And, and the idea is that you, you go out somewhere, maybe this is the problem in the UK because we don't have a lot of wilderness, but you go out into the wilderness somewhere and you attract some bees um, to a bait and then you mark them and you wait till they bring their friends back and then when there's more of them, you, you mark them and then you follow them, hopefully, and find out where they're living um, in a tree or in the wild. I think if I tried that here, I'd end up in somebody's garden looking at some hives, um, but it's, it's a charming idea. And I, I often think if I ever get to go to somewhere really wild, I'd love to try it. But apart from anything, it's, it's quite a slim book, but it's a really pleasant read, um, a nice read for the winter. And very quickly, um, this is one I read last year, which is called Manuka, the Biography of an Extraordinary Honey by Cliff Van Eaton. Um, and this is, this is a really good read, fascinating. It's, it's the background to the New Zealand Manuka uh, phenomenon, really how, um, it tells you the story of how this manuka was really just um, unappreciated honey that the farmers were, um, the, the beekeepers were subsidised um, um, to produce originally um, and nobody wanted it and then how they worked out that actually there might be some good in it and then how it, um, how it's, it's turned into a phenomenon ever since and all of the um, rather interesting um, economics and what have you. So that's quite an interesting read and last time I looked it was pretty cheap on Amazon as well. So there you are. There's, some stocking fillers for you all. Um, Richard, we've had a couple of um, couple of emails in yeah. um, uh, from Amanda, actually. Uh, where are we? Um, what happens to Varroa when colonies die? Do they die too, or do we need to ensure they're destroyed to stop them spreading elsewhere? It's an interesting question. Nobody's shouting out. Where, the, yeah. where did the thrower go? Um, I'm assuming that the, the colony has died um, in the hive, rather in this particular situation, rather than um, in sometimes with viruses and the colony is dying, the remaining bees leave. Um, you know, they leave a dying colony. And in that situation, the thrower go with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. That's a situation you don't really want. Um, uh, okay, and a, a, another one, um, which obviously is in response to uh, me saying about colonies dying of starvation 
when there are when there are stores on the frames alongside um has anybody tried an idea that's been suggested where the beekeeper makes a hole or pushes a gap through the comb on each frame to provide the bees with a shortcut to the next frame rather than having to climb up and over what do you think of this as an idea i think that's quite a good uh, quite a good one actually <laughs> I'll tell you something that I do, and it's not necessary for this reason, but I think it does help. Um, I use 14 by 12 brood frames, which are quite large, and my if I don't do anything about it, my bees nibble big holes in the comb always. So when I put the foundation in, I cut each corner off. Um, and the bees then tend to build nice walls at home, but they still leave those little corners. Um, so I think there's a lot of, um, they, they seem to like that, so there's probably a lot of um, traffic between the frames, which I, I suppose probably helps them um, in the winter. I did once um, make a kind of crown board, which was um, about two to three inches deep and divided into compartments. And then I put fondant in each compartment and put that on top of the um, frames, which seemed to encourage them to come up and use the fondant and then and then go back, back down to the next one. Um, the difficulty was that with that is, and I suppose there's a way of fixing it, is that the fondant tended when it was warm to then seep out of the out of the frame mm -hmm. and just on the top bars, which wasn't great. Mm. Has anyone else thought about poking holes in? in the I there's people that actually have done that here that I know of, but they use that as a standard. They'll drill holes in the um in the frames and. They say that it works, and I, I don't know if it's like the thing that's going to save the bees through the winter, but it's not going to hurt anything because if they don't want the holes there, they're going to either fill them with propolis or wax. So it's, I don't, I think go for it if that seems interesting to you. Yeah. Anything's worth a try, I think, when it comes to um, that sort of situation. Yeah. And, and there are, Taking, taking it to a further extreme, if, if isolation starvation is an issue, so the bees dying close to but not close enough to consume their, their food in a winter cluster, there are hives that have been designed from the ground up to, to, to counter things like that. So a design like the lion's hive, which, is, which has been designed, which turns the typical rectangular portrait as a landscape frame on its side. So they are cool. And skinny they're quite big frames but they're, they've been designed and and they are set in one horizontal box so imagine the the coming together of a top bar hive in terms of the way it looks or a long national a long langstroth with these portrait shaped frames inside and the theory behind them is that if we know that bees naturally move up but don't like to move up too far then there's enough enough depth in those layers frames that they will actually just put stores on the top and brood on the bottom. So they won't actually ever have to leave the frame that they're on. But that's to say that they're not going to move back and forth, so maybe we should have layers either with holes drilled in. Give them a bit of a highway too, but that, that's an option. We actually had an article in last month's Beecraft by Fred Ayres about um, designing a new sort of... Um, long hive and he, he mentioned those frames and i think there are some photographs of them in there in fact and he's going to have a follow-up article in the next couple of months um possibly looking at some ideas along those lines as well so keep an eye out um for that um well we've been at it for an hour and i have one or two other questions but um i think probably that would keep us busy for a little bit longer so um i think it's probably time to uh, to wrap it up so thank you all for joining us um Thank you guys for joining us from afar. I think this is probably My pleasure. one of the most geographically uh, diverse um, uh, hangouts we've had. Rodri will be back next month, I hope. Um, and the details of that will be in the um, in the next Beecraft. So thanks for joining us and goodbye for now. Can I just say? Hi, happy oh, Microscopy. It's microscopy with Bob, Bob Mora um, and the next hangout in November. Well, that should be really good, and, and um, I'm sure some of you have got Bob's book on microscopy, which is really worth having if you're interested um, interested in that subject. Sorry, just had to get that in. <laughs> okay, anybody else got any last minute? No. Well done, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you all soon. Okay, have fun. Good luck. Bye, everybody.